This is a discussion of a language, not Swahili, not Spanish, nor French, nor is it a discussion of a regional American dialect such as Brooklynese, Southern Mountaineer, or Pennsylvania Dutch. It is a discussion of another American dialect. Leroy, get on up now. Don't you hear that? Uh. You've been tossing and turning all night long. I ain't getting no sleep at all. We having them oats again. Eat your breakfast and shut up. TV off. Okay. I don't know. You to look. Brush your teeth. And I mean good. Don't slam that door. You come straight on home now. And don't be coming in here with no jive off the wall stuff. Ah, uh, you a story, baby. You know I come straight on home. Morning, Mr. Harris. Morning, Mr. Washington. How you go today? Oh, so-so. That sky's looking good out there today, Will. Yeah, I think we're gonna get a loose sun, all right. Listen, listen, man, you didn't miss it. George, you know you'd be having 10 dollars It had been several years since I had been in a barber shop back home. As I sat there, I wondered whether the conversation would have been as rich and lively had I been white. It wouldn't have been, of course. I was accepted. And it was comfortable to be involved again with the language of my culture. I must admit, some of the conversation was going so fast I had trouble catching it. Having been away so long, I was getting out of touch. Man, this would have been nice seeing you again. Yeah, like old time. Hey, I think I'll go poke around the neighborhood before going out to the airport. I'll see you next time, though. Yep, but don't you stay away so long. Yeah, man. See you. Bye. The old neighborhood hadn't changed much. What a lousy, miserable place. I walked around some old garbage and got the almost forgotten whiff of what it was like. The fact that it hadn't really changed was depressing. But as a kid, it was home, and somehow the freedom of childhood makes up for a lot of things. I had no trouble recognizing the old school. And it sounded pretty much the same. Pretty funny. Also, strict iambic tetrameter. But I didn't find that out until I took a creative writing course in college. Would you like a cocktail, sir? Yes, please. Scotch with a little water. It was good to be on my way again. But I never wanted to forget the ghetto. Whether I liked it or not, it was a big part of me. I resented it deeply, but I can't reject it. I can't forget or reject the sights of the ghetto, the smells of the ghetto, and especially the sounds of the ghetto. You know, I've often wondered how anybody can think that black people are nonverbal. In fact, we talk a lot, especially to one another. It's a recognized fact that black people have a very strong oral tradition. But many white Americans, as well as some blacks, attach a stigma to the black way of talking, rather than considering it as a rich and patterned dialect of English with its own well-established structure. Refusal to accept this as a legitimate mode of expression has long been the practice of many educational systems. The English teacher following this practice becomes the dedicated missionary of middle-class values. His vehicle is the language, and the language means standard English. There is no disagreement that fluency in standard English is necessary for formal communications, but the black child from the ghetto simply isn't learning it. Actually, the teacher is short-circuiting his own goals by rejecting the kid, his culture, and his language. 
Read the question. Um, Helene? What, do, what does what does the master Navo look like? Okay. The ghetto child gets to school speaking the language of the ghetto. He has trouble understanding the teacher because the teacher is not speaking the kind of language he uses or at least the language he's learning at home, where communication is easy. Charles, how come you keep poking me with them books? Young man, poking. get your hands off that pot. Well, stop you gonna burn yourself. It. Your mouth's about to make me lose my mind. I ain't need nothing all day. Go, go play with them children across the hall. Go on now. I'm going to beat you down the thing. wall. Oh, no, you ain't. Does anyone know the answer to that question? Debbie? I don't know. Billy? I don't know. Jean? Generally, by the time ghetto children reach the third grade, they turn off and could care less about school. I don't know. Let's go, Dad. Let's go, Dad. Let's go, Dad. And as they grow older, they know full well their speech is different. That Laverne, she's something else. Yeah, she like a boy named Willie. But she don't never say nothing to him. She act like she be scared of him or something. But I wonder why she still go around telling everybody he her boyfriend then. <laughs> Though their speech might be different, it works. It's their thing and their identity label. Those who have the gumption to stick with school travel in a world of teachers, both black and white, whom they don't understand and who don't understand them. Traditional education seems only to systematically perpetuate their cultural plight. Good morning, Joseph. You all set for graduation day? Yeah, it was a mean four years, but I made it. You were one of my best students. We're going to be really sorry to lose you. Ah, uh, you knew math was easy, Miss Williams, because you were a good teacher. Cut that out, Joseph. Your grades are already in. Do you know what you're going to be doing now? Yeah, I'm going to look for me some jobs. Well, let me know if you need any recommendations. Because I'll be happy to write you some. Solid, Miss Williams. I'm going to need some. Because I ain't going to get stuck in no factory job. The young man got his diploma, but he didn't get the language. And when he sits across the desk from the man who might be able to give him a job he wants, they both will be at a tremendous disadvantage. Mr. Jones is next, Mr. Petrie. Here's his application. Hello, Mr. Jones. Have a seat. Thanks. What's the weather like out? I got in sort of early this morning, and I haven't been out since. Yeah, it's pretty hip. <laughs> pretty hip? You can smoke if you like. Yeah, no, sir. I, I don't need no smoke. We'll have to get your full name in here. They left one space blank. Joseph Carruthers Jones. But they mostly calls me Joseph Jones, because Joseph Carruthers Jones is too long. Hmm. That middle name is spelled C-U-R-R-U-V? That, that's T, um, H. Oh. Carruthers. Joseph Carruthers Jones. That's quite a name. It's my mother's name. It ain't no new name. What did you study in school, Joe? Well, I... You know, I'd I be learning the same thing everybody else do. Such as? Math, science. Have any hobbies? Yeah, I, I kind of be working with my uncle on weekends. It's, it's not really a hobby, it's kind of a job. More like a job. And uh, what did you do there? Well, we used to get on cars, you know. Mm -hmm. and. and we sometimes be checking out clutches, you know, and brakes and carburetors. The thing, you know, the automobile thing. Oh, that's great, because it seems you've scored very highly in the mechanical aptitude section of our test. I think you ought to work in our machine shop. Yeah, but that's not what I want to do. I, you know, I, I, I can't be no mechanic. Well, let me tell you a little about the mechanical training program we have here. Yeah, but, but I, 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 Mr. Petrie, I, I don't want to do that. I mean... I'm really interested in having a desk job and a nameplate. Mm -hmm. I ain't gonna have none of that in no kind of tool shop. Then I'd be coming in with overalls and stuff, and I want a job would mean something. Mm -hmm. My mother don't want to see me in no overalls and grease, and I ain't interested That in seems it. to be your strongest area, though, and I think you should capitalize on your strongest features rather than going into an office job. Yeah, but my father do that. My uncle do that. There ain't no way I'm gonna do that. 
What did you say you studied in school, Mr. Jones? Hey, man, I told you that. The same thing everybody else studied. You know, that's why I come here. I mean, I went to high school and got a diploma, and now I'm supposed to get the kind of job I be chasing. Well, we've got you on file now, and uh, if anything comes up in the area you're interested in... But wait a minute. You mean you ain't got no office jobs for me? No, I'm sorry to say right now we don't. Yeah. Well... Have a good day, Mr. Jones. It was good seeing you. Yeah, thanks. Goodbye, Mr. Jones. He the one? Yeah, man. He done put the hurt on me. Give me a smoke. Here you go, baby. He a blue-eyed devil? Yeah, just another hunky, man. Wanted to give me one of them labor jobs. You know, like working on a machine or something. Didn't say nothing about all them office jobs in there. This articulate young man obviously begins and ends his interview with great limitations because of his dialect. His speech carries no respect. In fact, it generates negative attitudes. This makes it very difficult for the interviewer to make a fair decision about the qualifications of such young people as Joseph, whose dialect substantially limits their choice of jobs. In other countries, dialects are often used and accepted and enjoyed. <laughs> and what did the last do after that remark? Uh, she looks me direct in the eye and replies, and why should I be looking up your kilt when the bunny fair man at the bar just bought me a scotch? <laughs> You're a cheap rat, that's what you are. <laughs> and she tosses a drink down like a guard and whoop, she prances to yon bar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, and I hope that shipment arrived from Marcus Brothers. No, sir, it didn't. Give him a call, Scotty. Find out what's wrong. Good old Marcus, brothers. Late again. These men slipped back and forth from the Scottish brogue to standard English. What's interesting is that among themselves they spoke in brogue. But when a fellow worker entered to discuss a business subject, they used standard English, which was what was appropriate for that situation. Why, then, is black dialect frowned upon? William, would you like another drink? Oh, yeah, thank you. Say, did you see the play last night? I certainly did. What did you think of it? I thought it was marvelous. Yeah, it was rather good. I, I thought the acting was superb. Mm, charming. Mm. Can you imagine the reaction at a mixed party if the black head of the history department turned down a martini from his white hostess with, if you had asked me before, I might have could. I'm tore up now. It would cause a mild riot. The middle-class black must be careful of the language he is using, or rather, which language he is using. Only a few black Americans have been able to operate freely within both cultures, using both languages. Such men as Martin Luther King often used features of the dialect. The eradication of slums is far more complex than integrating buses. And this is where we are at the present time. And it is in this context that we must understand the so-called white backlash. The white backlash is merely a new name for an old phenomenon. Now, you know some funny things are happening here in Alabama already. Have you heard any of these candidates talk about segregation? They, they, they kind of go over that issue now. They're not even campaigning. It was his means, and a very effective means, of speaking directly to the culture involved. On the streets of black America, there is no choice. Life and its meanings only come alive with the dialect. Hey, Tree Top, what's happening, baby? Hey, now fish out, man. Ain't nothing happening. Man, I ain't seen you for a while. Look like you don't even put down your barber. Oh, baby, you hush. Look at yourself. Look like your bush ain't been shaped up since the coach went out of style. Hmm. Well, you know, man. Where you staying at, baby? Well, big. I stay on Green Street, but uh, I be up on 43rd. Well, well, how you taking care of yourself nowadays? Well, dig, I got me this little old hang seat, but... Uh, wow, man. Only thing is, I got to hang it up. What's wrong, baby? See, I got this here new boss. You mean you got yourself a Mr. Charlie, huh? No, man, it'd be worse than that. You remember Irvin Taylor? 
Here, a cat used to work with me. That dude. Yeah, I remember that jive split. Well, dig, man. That boot done tarmed himself right on into the form of the outfit. No, man, you don't mean that shine is popping the bull whip down at the plant. Yeah, you? man. That Oreo and his handkerchief here itself be down on my back all the time. I can't cut it no longer, man. I got to keep on pushing. Yeah, he was always walking around trying to act like Whitey and talk proper and whatnot. Right on, man. On the job, see, he be brown nosing every Whitey he see. No stuff. Man. Oh, yeah, man. He be too much. Hey, 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 man. But dig, I got my bread today. So I'm going to make it on down to the club tonight. So listen, man, you better get with that gig, because there's going to be some stone foxes there. Right on, baby. Me too. I got to check out this gig, you know, so I can lay one of my fine wraps on one of them fine mommies. You ain't kidding, <laughs> baby. That's why I'm fixing to get me some new shoes. Dig it. I would say you need to do something about them ashy heels hey, now, and look, them holy baby. shoes no, no, that you no. wear. Don't you worry about a thing, Jack, because uh, I'm going to be clean tonight. Dig it. <laughs> <laughs> the colorful dialect of the ghetto is full of identity labels that can only be completely understood when one has lived with black experiences. In the dialect, there are many words for black attitudes and behavior. They involve cultural rejection, social deception, and overtones of meaning that cannot really be expressed in standard English. It is a sad and tragic comment on the American scene that most of these labels are negative and are used to classify the black in his relationship with white society. The expressions used in this conversation included boot, jive splib, oreo, shine, tom, and handkerchief head. There are many more. The word oreo, for example, is the brand name for a cookie. Black on the outside and white on the inside, oreo is a severe put-down. In a similar vein, white attitudes have forced the black into being extremely color conscious. He has countless words for skin color, ranging from bright to smutty black, and uses them freely for self-ridicule or to express pride. Middle-class blacks meeting to pass along the same ideas would first off be inclined to use less spirited language. Actually, they would find it difficult to communicate the same ideas in standard English. This same scene, translated into formal standard English, is stilted and uncomfortable. Hello, Harry. How are you? Hello, George. Just fine. Boy, I haven't seen you for a while. Need a haircut, huh? Well, yes. <laughs> but apparently so do you. <laughs> Where do you live now? I live on Green Street, uh, but you can usually find me on 43rd. Mm -hmm. Well, are you working at all now? Yeah, at the moment. But I'm planning to resign. Oh, oh really? What's wrong? There is some friction between the new supervisor and me. Why? Is he prejudiced? No, it's more complicated than that. Do you remember Irving Taylor? He worked with me. Oh, yeah, yeah, the black fella. Yeah, I believe I do know him. Well, he's worked himself up to foreman of our department. You mean the brother has actually gotten himself promoted? Yes, he... He makes a point of harassing me. Hmm. I can imagine. You know, he always did act kind of snooty. He tries to ingratiate himself with everyone, especially the white workers. Hmm. Yeah. It's really overdone. Hey, listen. I'm going to a dance tonight. You should be there, because there's going to be some pretty girls around. I know, I know. I intend to be there, too. All right. <laughs> well... I'll be on my way to shop for some shoes. Yes, I, I, I see you really could use a pair of shoes for those feet of yours. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you'll see. I'll be looking much better tonight. Okay, we'll see you a little later. Black dialect is an expressive, vivid, living language. If we reject it, how little have we gained? And how much have we lost? While blacks have acquired other qualifications for moving up the middle class ladder, their dialect has never been accepted. So from childhood on, they have been rigorously drilled in how to correct it. As a result, many middle class blacks who have made the difficult transition to the dominant culture have paid the price of dropping all traces of the dialect from their speech. It is surely time that the speech of the black culture of America be recognized as a genuine dialect of English. It is, in every sense of the word, a dialect, 
with its own vocabulary, pronunciation, and grammar. It has its own words and word meanings, its own patterns of pronunciation, and a highly systematic grammatical structure. The subject is a touchy one. Most people who believe in integration avoid discussing racial differences. Though differences exist, it is not only bad taste to mention them, it places one in the awkward stance of being labeled as a racist. The irony of this is that both blacks and whites, who are most interested in bringing about racial equality, shy off certain facts that deserve recognition. There are cultural differences, a truth that not only supports integration, but will help bring about honest equalities. This is, after all, the ultimate objective of integration. The African black helped settle the country. For his own survival, he had to pick up a little English. This superimposed English had to be integrated with the many African languages that were forced together. So close and yet so far from the dominant white culture, he was left to make do, separate and apart, getting his greatest joy and comfort simply from being with others like himself and talking with them. The inevitable result was a language of his own that combined a little bit of everything he needed to survive. If you want to go to heaven, boy, when you die, be ready when your freedom comes. You got to stop with your tongue from telling them lies. Be ready when your freedom comes. First on the plantations, then in black communities throughout the nation, the language developed. It became very strong, very inside, and very deep. And it retained many African structures and characteristics. Not understanding it, nor caring, the white culture considered it inferior. I hate to hear that freight train blow. Unlike those with other dialects, who can often hear that they are simply speaking differently, blacks themselves believed that they were speaking poor English. These ideas were often perpetuated by the myths that blacks had poor hearing or that their lips and tongues were too thick to speak English properly. Oh, walk together, children! Don't you get weary. In spite of this, the dialect had made rich contributions to the mainstream in manners, music, and language. Actually, the two forms of English have existed side by side for over 300 years, and they have always borrowed from each other. Today, black dialect is picked up by groovy kids and groovy grown-ups as well. To resist it is square indeed. Blue-eyed soul brothers and sisters feel the same out-of-sight need to use black expressions. Vocabulary in black dialect is often referred to as slang. Actually, it is a response to things for which there is no word in standard English, and slang is often more descriptive. In the wintertime, the wind from the northern lakes is severe enough to defy description. But the black ghetto gave it a name, Hawk. And the hawk was howling. I never felt a more biting, bitter wind. It not only reached my bones, it seemed to go right inside them. It was not a night to be waiting for no bus. Taxi! Man, that's some hawk out there. Yes, sir. You mean Mr. Hawkins done come to town tonight? Hmm. Mr. Hawkins done come to town tonight. Personalizing the old hawk made it chilling indeed, giving it a sinister connotation which extended a descriptive dialect word into one with a deep, complex meaning. 
Centuries of anti-Negro thinking have provided little incentive to take the language seriously. And the fact that many black children were slow learners was always passed off as racial inferiority or the degrading result of poverty and environment. Actually, a key to the learning problem is a basic language problem. This is not a new discovery. There is an event recorded by William Francis Allen during the Civil War. He was teaching a group of Gullah Negro children in South Carolina. The Gullah dialect found in the southern United States is a stylized language borrowed from the West Indies. One day, when particularly disheartened by his pupil's lack of response, Allen resorted to a question with an obvious answer. Now, children, this is something you all know. What color is the sky? The sky. Up there. What color is the sky? Excuse me, Mr. Allen. I'm a little early, but I like to pick up Tom. Well, sir, the way I feel, you can pick them all up. Their ignorance is beyond me. Even the simplest question gets no answer. Watch. Children, who can tell me the color of the sky? You see? Mr. Allen, and let me try that. Tom, how sky stand? Blue! Apparent ignorance had dissolved into a simple language problem. From the Gullah dialect, the word stan translates as look or appear. How sky stand? Blue! This event, reported over a hundred years ago, seems to symbolize how language difficulties readily give us false impressions about intelligence. Similarly, a child may not respond if he's afraid his speech will be constantly corrected. This lack of response often is mistaken for ignorance. Through the years, many educators, personnel people, and others in our society have been aware of this language difficulty with standard English. But only recently has there been any concerted effort to analyze and evaluate black dialect as a systematic language within itself. Not long ago, a linguist who has spent much of his life studying the black dialect made a dialect translation of the well-known poem, The Night Before Christmas. It was more a labor of love than anything else, and he had planned to use it simply as a novel Christmas greeting. One evening, I was at home working on the transcription of the poem when some of my young friends dropped by. I left the draft of the transcription in the typewriter and went over to the refrigerator to get them some snacks. While I was in the kitchenette, I noticed 12-year-old Lenora glancing at the transcription. She seemed interested, and I was curious about her reaction. So I asked her to read it aloud, and she did. <coughs> it's the night before Christmas, and here in our house, it ain't nothing moving, not even no mouse. There goes our stocking hung, hung up real high, so Santa can fill them up wherever, whenever he come by. Now, the really remarkable thing about Lenora's performance was that she was known to be a problem reader. I was sure that my translation was close to pure dialect as she spoke it, but I had not expected her to read it so easily. Yet she read with inflection and meaning, and there seemed to be no real problem whatsoever. You all have been good children, and that's why I'm here. Merry Christmas to you all, and I'll see you next year. Hey, now I'm better than I thought I was. You sure are, Lenora. That was great. That ain't proper English, is it? But that's proper spelling. Why is it so easy? Here, Lenora, try this. I then gave her a copy of the original standard English version of the poem. Uh, uh, what's that? Twas. What's that mean? It means it was. Go ahead, Lenora. I'll help you if you have any trouble. Tut-tut was the, the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a how come I'm getting so mixed up? Well, it's a little different than the one you first read. That should be creature. Oh, not a creature cre cre was st stirring, not even a mouse. Lenora's problem with the regular version of the poem was that she could not cope with the unfamiliar grammar. 
The translated version used standard English spellings, so it was apparent that sound spelling correspondences were not entirely the problem. The, the moon on the breeze of the new fun filling snow gave the gave the letter of really day to object below. Good. I'm glad that's over. This unplanned experiment was duplicated with other inner city children and always with positive results. It suggested an approach to adapting beginning reading material to the sentence patterns of the non-standard translation. Such a reader was written with a separate translation in standard English. This foreign language type reader is now being used in a selected group of schools and with excellent results. In teaching standard English as a second language, it would appear that the first step is to isolate the grammatical interference points. For example, the verbs am, is, and are are generally omitted in correct usage of the dialect. The standard English sentence, Leroy is at home, would be said, Leroy at home. In the dialect, such verbs are not necessary to make a complete sentence. Hi. Hey, John. Where's Tom? He busy? Where Billy and Jack? They home? Where Mama at? She working. Well, what are I supposed to do? You're supposed to shut up and watch TV. I'm going to go to the store. I'll be back in a minute. Efficient communication. And to the point. When the sister answered the brother's question, Where Mama at? She working. The boy might well have asked, Where's she working? In correct dialect grammar, she working indicates the action is going on now and probably is not a regular occurrence. The boy might very well have asked where his mother was working. However, had the sister answered, She be working. It would have meant that the mother was working where she usually worked, a repeated state of action that the child is familiar with. Standard English has no such usage of the verb form be. Depending on where you're sitting, she be working is not bad English just good dialect. The rules for the use of plurals are completely different. Correct dialect would answer the question, how many brothers does Deborah have? Deborah have three brother. Brothers is not used because the dialect system does not require pluralization when some other word in the sentence shows that more than one thing is meant. The fact that three is used makes it unnecessary to do it again with the plural of brother. The dialect considers this a grammatical redundancy, and it is completely logical. In this example, note that there is a systematic disagreement between the subject and the verb. Deborah have three brother. Not Deborah has three brother. If we have a plural subject, the verb remains the same. Deborah and Jane have three brother. Deborah have three brother. There, the same verb. It's simple, and if you stop to think about it, no more strange than some of the rules of standard English. Imagine how awkward and puzzling standard English must sound to the good dialect speaker. Grammatical differences between the dialect and standard English go on and on. In these differences, the dialect is consistent, and geographical variations are no more than we find in standard English, or any other language for that matter. Though some may fear that accepting the child's dialect as valid language will reinforce the use of the dialect, what's wrong with that, if the child learns standard English in the process? Most of the child's life outside the classroom is spent using the language of his culture. He's got to have that language to survive. If he becomes more articulate in this dialect, so much the better. Anything that improves his ability to communicate is worthwhile. And there is proof plenty that being articulate in two languages in no way impairs the use of either. Which language is used depends largely upon the place and situation. In the social environment, dialect occurs very naturally. But this does not override the fact that standard English is important and indeed necessary in many situations. Many languages and several dialects other than standard English are spoken in this country. La lección de hoy tiene dos partes. La primera parte es sobre adjetivos en inglés 
y la segunda parte de la lección será sobre los meses del año. In our teaching of standard English to Spanish-speaking children, it would be absurd not to teach them through their own language. En inglés, los adjetivos se colocan delante de la palabra en vez de después, como en español. Leva and Ali playing together. They play in front of the house. Ali tell Leroy, he say, I want some soda. And Leroy say, I want some soda too. So Ali and Leroy, they, they go inside the house and see can they find Mama. Ali say, Mama, we want 10 cents for some soda. Ali say, Mom, Mama say, he go 10 cents for, so, for the soda. Likewise, those black children who speak the dialect must be taught standard English through their own language. So Ali and Leroy go in the store, in the street. Leroy kick the can to Ali, and Ali kick the can back to Leroy. They have lots of fun playing kick the can. The teacher need not be fluent in the dialect, only aware of the obvious interference points. Instruction can focus on these differences. Now, in standard English, the sentence Charles and Michael, they outplaying, needs the verb are. So the sentence Charles and Michael, they outplaying, could be said, Charles and Michael, they are outplaying. Now, let's try it together. Charles and Michael, they are outplaying. Charles and Michael, they are outplaying. Again. Charles and Michael, they are out playing. Right. The teacher, rather than giving the children two things to cope with at the same time, has settled on the sentence, Charles and Michael, they are out playing. Once the children fully grasp the standard use of the verbs am, is, and are, she can explain that standard English does not require a double subject and that the pronoun they can be dropped. Charles and Michael, they out playing. Charles and Michael, they are out playing. They out playing. They are out playing. He out playing. He is out playing. We out playing. We is up out playing. Seeing and hearing the differences in grammar is fundamental. The fine points of phonology and pronunciation can be learned later. Under no condition should the speaker's use of the dialect be considered something inferior, bad, or an indicator of his intelligence. It should simply be considered something different, which is all it is. The important thing is to keep the ghetto child talking. Respecting the guarded language of his identity and survival will open the door to his learning something new. This attitude, reinforced with oral techniques, will lead to success. There are some who believe that the meeting ground between the two cultures will first have to be in the language. Certainly, if we are not in genuine communication, the real problems of social and economic inequalities will not be solved. Teacher attitude and oral techniques in the early grades will prepare the child to learn when he feels the need. This will probably not occur until the later years of grade school or high school when he understands the value of speaking standard English. Actually, he doesn't need to learn it at all until he has to make a living. Sorry to wake you, sir. We're landing now. You'll have to fasten your seatbelt. Oh, thank you. Uh, I wasn't sleeping. Just thinking. Sugar cake, sugar cake, cream on top. Tell me the name of...